Thanks so much for coming, y'all. Um, so tonight's lesson is going to be on anxiety. As y'all know, we've been um, doing lessons on mental illness, and this week's is anxiety. So I wanted to start off with a definition that I found. Um, it says, anxiety is an abnormal and overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear, often marked by physical signs, such as tension, sweating, and increased pulse rate, by doubt concerning the reality and nature of the threat, and by self-doubt about one's capacity to cope with it. So when I was like starting off, kind of like trying to figure out where to, like what to differentiate worrying and anxiety, I was like, okay, like I know these are two different things, but like we usually say the same word, the, both of those words for the same thing. But anxiety has a physical reaction. Worrying is something that you just, just to say like, oh yeah, I'm worrying about something. But when you're anxious about something, you sweat, you know, you're like getting tense, your pulse rate goes up, you have an anxiety attack. I know I've dealt with those, I don't know, maybe some of y'all have too. So anxiety has an actual physical reaction to it. Um, I find this definition to be perfect for what we're talking about tonight. First, I wanna give y'all a little backstory about myself. Um, so as most of y'all probably have, I've dealt with anxiety for a long time. It started probably in middle school, you know, girls are all like, ooh, like, I don't know if I'm pretty enough, like, oh, am I, I don't know if y'all done this, but like, you know when you go on a date or something or you're sitting next to a guy that you might like, and you're like, mm, like, I can't eat too much because like, what the food gets stuck in my teeth or something? Like, you'd be like, ooh, getting a little anxious about that, right? Just little things like that, that like, shouldn't cause you that much anxiety, but with society today, it does. And I know like with social media and stuff like that, it just causes you to get anxious about things that we shouldn't even be anxious about, you know? Um, and then when I got into high school, it started turning into more of being anxious about the future and like what that would hold, like will I go to college? And as y'all know, I'm still here, so I'm um, Like will I do stuff like that? When will I get married? Like you see all your friends starting to date and like they've been dating for so long and like, oh man, they're gonna get married soon. I'm not in a relationship right now. Like what does God have planned for me? And that can cause you anxiety too, you know? Um, so, let's see. So anxiety has been a part of my life for some time now, and that's why I felt called to lead this lesson in our series of mental illness lessons. Going back to the definition of anxiety I shared, I feel like it hits on something that I didn't really used to understand before, but now I do. And that's the anxiety that God talks about in the Bible. That kind of anxiety is consuming. It's not just like worry like about one little thing or something like that. This anxiety that he talks about in the Bible is something that consumes you, weighs you down. And so I didn't used to think about that before. I would just think like, oh, if you're worrying about one little thing, oh, that's sinful. Oh, like I can't worry about anything. But the anxiety he talks about in the Bible is something that consumes you, consumes your every day. Um, Proverbs 12 verse 5, 25 states, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Hearing this verse, it shows that if we dwell on things that cause us to have anxious thoughts, it weighs us down, not lifts us up. Matthew 6, verse 31 says, Therefore do not be anxious, say, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? These are trivial, everyday things that we shouldn't let cause us anxiety. And if we are, we're probably consumed by anxiety. If you're letting what you're eating, or what you're drinking, or what you're wearing, as most of us, you know, we have a roof over our heads, we're not living on the streets or anything, if we're letting things like that cause us anxiety, what about those bigger things out there like college or like what am I going to do when I'm older? Those things probably do too. So you're probably consumed with anxious thoughts. And I for one can attest to the fact that I was in that place once. Always worrying about what to eat, how I'm eating, if people like me, what to wear, you name it, I probably got anxious about it. And let me tell you that's not a good place to be at because as I said earlier, it consumes you, it weighs you down. And then it also, one of the things, it causes you not to have your thoughts first on the Lord. Your thoughts are on those anxious thoughts and you're not putting God first in your life. Another part I wanna stress about the definition is the part that said self-doubt of one's capacity to cope with the situation. I kinda of wanna push back on this and say that we don't have the capacity to do this on our own. This has been a theme throughout everyone's lessons. We don't have the capacity to deal with anxiety and things like that on our own. We need God's help. Um, I'm sure some of you have been at a point where you feel like anxiety was consuming you. And like I just said, God's the only one that can get you through that. God asks us to trust in him with all things and to not lean on our own understandings. Proverbs 3 verse 5. Just think of non-Christians out there. Like I can't imagine being not a Christian and not having the thought of God, he's got my back. Like even though I might not know what's going to happen next, like I just got to put my trust in him. They don't have that. So can you like just imagine like 
being anxious and just being like, okay, like I just gotta sit here in it. Like I don't know, and I don't got anyone that's gonna help me out, so I'm just sitting here. Like the people that don't know God, that's gotta be crazy. As has been a common oh, all right, step back. <laughs> Rewind this. Um, but yeah, God also doesn't cause us uh, to figure this out on our own. First Peter five six through seven says, "Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God." So that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And I know, as most of y'all do, it's hard to relinquish control to somebody. As us as humans, we like to be in control of our lives. We like to know when this, this, or that, or whatever is going to happen next. And it's hard to be in a position where you don't know what's going to happen or how to react to a situation or whatever. And that's really hard. But us as all of us in here know that God cares for us and he's going to be there for us and he wants the best for us so we need to cast our anxieties onto him so that he can take that away from us and give us peace um and i think one thing that kind of goes with that is you can't just give your trust to someone that you don't know so one thing that's helped me a lot with anxiety is i need to get to know god better so that i can trust him because you're not just going to put your trust in someone that you don't know that wouldn't be smart so you have to start to read and study. Don't just read your Bible. Like, look, I can get up every morning, read my verse for the day. Okay, good. Go about my business. What did I learn from that? Nothing. I dwelled on it for like, what, two seconds and I'm gone? So you need to make sure that you're studying it. And studying isn't just doing it on your own. Studying is seeking wise counsel, going out to those people, you know, and making sure that you got it right so that you can get to know God to his fullest. So therefore, when you put your trust in him, it's easier for you to let those anxieties go and for his peace to wash over you. Um, next, uh, I want to look at a couple more verses in Matthew 6. I'm going to read, now I'm going to be reading verses 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, which will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So I want to take a look at a couple, of, just two of these verses in here. Um, verse 27 makes an important point. point. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? It kind of goes back to us not being in control. We cannot, we, y'all, we can't add a single hour to our life. We don't have that kind of control. We're just here on the earth, mind our business, real play. God's the, pow, uh, the potter. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and we, we don't have any control in that. So anxious thoughts only add stress to our lives. It adds stress over things that we don't have control over. We need to give it to God because he's the only one that can actually take it from us. And then verse 33 also says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God gives us a way to help the anxiety. Seek him first, and the things you're anxious about will be added to you. Now let me make sure I tell y'all this. This does not mean that you're gonna get everything you want or everything that you have been anxious about in your life. I might be like, man, I really wish I had that Louis Vuitton bag, like all these girls are, and like, oh my word, I'm gonna look crazy walking in. Egg, like what? God ain't gonna be like, oh girl, I got you. Like, you one of my people, I got you. Let me give you that bag. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. He is here for us. He's gonna give us what we need. I don't need a Louis Vuitton bag. Be nice. I don't need it. He'll give us what we need. And then, as long as you continue to obey him and have faith in him, heaven is the reward of the day. And that's gonna be better than anything that he can give you on earth. Um, so, I want to talk about this example that one of these preachers talked about um, in the sermon not too long ago. Uh, his name is Chris Emerson. He has a podcast, really, really good. Um, so he was talking about the steps to holiness. And it doesn't have to be holiness, but that's the word that he used in it. And he talked about, he went from grace 
to faith to life, and life is life works too. And so it talks about these are the steps to be holy, to be saved, and everything like that. So grace is just understanding God's grace to the full extent of like God's grace was here before you were even born in your life at some point, whether it be like Jesus died on the cross for y'all, like all of us in here, He died on the cross for. That shows God's grace too. Some of y'all, y'all have families that are Christians too. That's God's grace that you're born into a Christian family. You already got that one step. So God's grace, once you have a full understanding of that, then you start to have your own kind of faith. And when you have your faith and you trust in God, after that, the works and the life will follow suit. And so one of the things, the reason I want to talk about that is because if you have an anxiety problem, it's a faith problem. Because faith is trusting in God and knowing who he is. And if you have an anxiety, like if you're being consumed by your anxious thoughts, you're not trusting in God. And it might not be like as simple like as that, like you might just be like, oh yeah, I just don't trust you, God. Like, but if you're starting, if you're consumed by your anxious thoughts on everything and you're not trusting that God's gonna do what he said he's gonna do, then you're not having faith in him. Then if your faith, if the faith part is messed up, the life part starts to get messed up too. Because then you can't really, you know, do the works as God calls us to do, as like good as you need to, you know? Um, I want to look at two examples of people in the Bible who dealt with anxious thoughts. So we have Job. You know, we talked about Job last year at Mana. Not, I know most of y'all weren't here, but we talked about Job. And he got everything taken away from him. And if y'all think he wasn't anxious, y'all crazy. Because y'all know, if you have every single thing taken away from you, and I know most of us in here won't have that in our lifetime, but if you have every single thing taken away from you, your family, all of your riches and everything, and the devil is literally trying to be like, yeah, you need to curse God and just die. Like, your wife is telling you curse God and die? Like, you're literally, and I know it goes farther into depression for him, but you're right there being consumed with anxiety. Yet, Job gave it to God. He never cursed God. He went through those times of worry, but then he remembered, he's like, you know what, God? Let me just give it all to you, because you're the one in control. And then what happened? God gave him twice as much as he had before. Talk about the importance of leaning on God and Christ being your firm foundation. If you have God as your firm foundation and Christ as your firm foundation, I mean, that changes your life right there. Like, you already got a one up on other people out there. And it's hard to get to that place, trust me, but it's a good place to be in. Um, and then lastly, I wanna talk about David. Um, he also dealt with a lot of anxiety, as you can see in some of the Psalms. Probably, probably from being called the king, oh no, not probably from being called, probably from being the king, of God's chosen people, and maybe even from being called a man after God's own heart. Like, talk about pressure right there. Like, you got called a man after God's own heart. Like, I wish I could be called a woman after God's own heart, but man, that is some pressure right there, and that's got to cause you some anxiety. But I want to look at Psalm 77. I feel like kind of hits the nail on this. Okay, Psalm 77 says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and He will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night of my in the night, my hand is stretched out without weary. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, Let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever? And never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the water saw you, O God, when the water saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. I'm the best. That's pretty powerful. Um, this is just some closing out statements. 
Being anxious all the time comes from a place of fear and not trusting in God, as I said. Uh, another thing that Mr. Chris Emerson said in his sermon not that long ago was that whenever he visits older people around their 70s who are nearing death, they get consumed with anxiety. Even though they were a devout, emphasis on the devout part, Christian, that they'll not go to heaven and that may, they made one too many sins or they sinned too bad one time. These elderly people are so consumed with anxiety, they think that what God has promised to those who believe and obey isn't true. Even though they may not say those exact words, that's what that is. Those anxious thoughts that I have I, woo, as I have already said, causes a faith problem. And the only way to solve this is to get to know God better. You don't blindly put your faith into someone you don't know, do you? So what I want to encourage each of you to do is get to know God as much as you can. We can't know the fullness of his power because it's immeasurable, but we can see how much he loves us and how he never breaks a promise. He will give peace to those who ask for it.